Hey, hello everybody. How you doing? My name is Frank Collin. I'm a correspondent anchor at CNBC. I'm so sorry I can't be with you there in person, but very excited to be part of this conversation. Karen McCarty, great to be here with both of you as well and just kick off this conversation about whether digitization can democratize finance. Hard to say three times fast, but obviously it's very important. <laughs> Um, Kara, if you don't mind if I start with you, and Kara, Bakari, I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, John was leading a really great conversation just a few minutes ago. I want to ask both of you, how do you see cryptocurrency, Bitcoin in particular, probably the cryptocurrency most of us are the most familiar with? Do you see it as a stored value, as a, a payment? Is there some other use for it that maybe we haven't discovered yet, Kara? So I think right now it's been used as a really as a store of value or understanding that it, it has a value and there's only 21 million of them ever to be mined. So right now people are, are buying, trading, selling them as if they are almost property, right? An asset, a commodity. And so right now for payments, it's not an extremely, it's not a great use case because again of the volatility, because of the issues, frankly, there are tax issues that come up. So right now I think it's, it's primarily store of value, but it could evolve. I think well, we'll see with other assets, you have even greater evolution happening. But I think right now it's a great example of where there is some certainty, especially regulatory certainty for Bitcoin. And I, again, I think that it's just, it's gonna continue to be valuable for, for folks. I would actually agree with her sentiment. First of all, good morning, good morning. everybody. <laughs> I'm from the big city of Denmark, South Carolina, where we have three stoplights and a blinking light. And my mom and dad always tell me the two most important words in the English language are the words thank you. And they're not nearly said enough. So thank you to John Hope Bryan. Thank you to everybody here. Thank you to people who are on this panel who are much smarter than I. Um, and thank you to all of you all for being here. I agree, um, especially when you talk about wealth and equity, which is part of the reason that I'm here today. Uh, because there are a lot of individuals who look at Bitcoin in particular as a way to catch up in a society in which we've been left behind. And they look at it as a new tool by which a, you can store value and you can accrue mm -hmm. some type of wealth, a new opportunity to gain wealth. Um, how true that is, um, I'm not sure. Um, and asking where we will be in, in four or five years to somebody with anxiety is probably not the question you should ask me. Um, <laughs> however, I can tell you, uh, that over the past two, three weeks, there's been a great deal of trepidation. Um, but I do think that with that trepidation comes opportunity. Um, and so as we talk about wealth and equity, and we'll, we'll talk about that as we go forward a little bit, uh, there's a lot of work to be done truly in the sector. Uh, but for right now, there are a lot of people who are gravitating towards this new currency, for lack of a better term, as an opportunity to catch up to white folk. Y'all laughing like that wasn't a true statement. <laughs> now I feel bad for not saying thank you, honestly. So thank you as well. Um, I'm from Wyoming. I have four stoplights in my hometown, oh, there, there you and go. Right. only seven or nine thousand people. So I feel like we're we're, we're kindred spirits here. All right. <laughs> so. I think a lot of us are trying to figure out, just to Bakar's point, exactly what, what is cryptocurrency, especially Bitcoin, and some of these other coins that we may not be familiar with. But Kara, I think you have a lot of insights. So can you tell us who is Coinbase's customer and has it changed from today to who the customer was before the pandemic? Absolutely. So uh, Coinbase, as I think many of you know, we're the largest U.S. base exchange. We were founded in 2012, really with like the sole purpose of making it safe, secure, trusted, compliant, and an easy way to access the crypto economy. At the time, it was only Bitcoin. At that time, it was the only asset we listed, and it was the only thing that we would allow people to get on our platform to buy, sell, trade. Now that has evolved to about 140 different assets, and those are all different assets that go through a really rigorous listing process, again, to make sure that they're legal, that they're compliant, mm -hmm. that they're secure. And I think the way that the evolution of our asset listing, the evolution of our products, of who we work with, uh, that has evolved as we've seen the customers evolve. So a year ago, in 2021, we just saw a huge explosion of growth. We saw that across the crypto economy. It wasn't limited to just Bitcoin or to other types of stable coins. It was really a across the market. And so we've seen generally that customer growth in the US as well as overseas. Overseas is a huge market. We've got about 90 million global customers. We have about 10,000 institutional customers. We also have a growing group of developers who are our customers in the sense that they work with our platform, they're developing projects, they're innovating, they're using blockchain technology, they're using assets to really innovate. So over the last year, we've seen, again, the customer base, and again, we've seen a lot of different data that's come out from people who are, who are doing research in this space. It it tends to skew younger, although we're seeing more in above 40 who are starting to, to access the, the ecosystem. It tends to skew male. 
and and then over the in terms of kind of um, how we look at how it's broken down, it actually skews closer toward more uh, African American and um, Hispanics, and so as a general part of the population. So about one in five, I think it was said on the last panel, about one in five Americans now own crypto, and I think that that will just continue to grow over the next two years. Yeah, to Kara's point, and even Bakari, to your point, um, a lot of black and brown people do see cryptocurrency, Bitcoin or Dogecoin, whichever one it is, as a way to catch up to white people financially. As a matter of fact, just anecdotally, when I go to the gym now, everybody has their headphones on. But a couple of months ago, everybody had their beats off. They were talking about Dogecoin, Solana, and everybody was getting cryptocurrency. Since we've seen that crash, uh, a lot less chatter in the gym. So question for you, Bakari, what kind of regulation do we need to see or what kind of uh, intervention, either from the federal government, state or local government, to create more financial inclusion in the crypto space? I mean, that's a, that is a really, really good question. And the answer is somewhat uncertain right now. I think the work that Coinbase is doing, uh, checking and verifying, making sure that, they, that many of these new coins have uh, some regulation, abide by some rule of law, is actually very, very valuable. I think the first thing we have to do, though, is have some level, and this is my Republican, libertarian talking point, have some level of individual responsibility. Um, just as you would not put everything in Ford or GM, you shouldn't put everything in Dogecoin or Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever the new Bakari Sellers coin is. You have to diversify just as you would do anything else. That sounds very, very simple, but there are people who are gambling with their lives or their pocketbooks. So that, that's kind of first. The second thing is there are a lot of bullshit coins out here that are backed by like faith and like hope, right? <laughs> and, and so you have, there, there has to be a mechanism in place, whether or not it's the FTC or whether or not it's your state and local government. In South Carolina and in Georgia, for that matter, we really don't have the capacity. We don't necessarily have officials with the depth or understanding of this new currency. And um, we don't have the resources necessary to dig in and make sure that everything is above board. And so I think that there has to be a concerted effort by legislatures, particularly throughout the South, to beef up or create uh, some regulatory bodies. Now, you don't want to overregulate. You don't want to force anything out. But outside of Ethereum uh, and, and Bitcoin and maybe Dogecoin, I found myself investing in SafeMoon one day, and then I should have jumped off a building. Um, <laughs> but you know, you 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 understand these things. Uh, but there are, there are a lot of, um, and I think I think uh, John Hope said it best. There are a lot of people that are taking advantage and preying on individuals with coins that aren't backed by much. And that's when you begin to get in trouble and that becomes a stain on the entire industry. The fact is though, and we have to speak this truth to power, just as about 1% of uh, the dollar, uh, excuse me, 1% of the individuals in this country control about 30% of the dollar, um, I think the number is about 0.01% control about 27% of Bitcoin. Did everybody follow that? So what you understand is why you have an inequity problem with the dollar if that's a cold, then it's cancer when it comes to Bitcoin. Um, and so while there is a lot of hope for black and brown people to utilize Bitcoin and uh, different cryptocurrencies to be somewhat of a panacea to systemic inequities we see or the wealth inequities we see, we realize that that is more of a dream than a reality right now. And so the question has to be uh, to the industry, and I'm not even sure if it's an industry or a figment of our imagination, how do we remedy that and how do we control that? And Frank, if I could jump in, I think <clears throat> he, you, on the last panel, and I think what Bakari was just saying is really important. When we talk about unlocking innovation and unlocking access, generally you will hear from industries, don't, don't overregulate, don't regulate us. I think what you're seeing from the crypto industry, right. I think the, the valid, le legitimate players, we're saying we do want regulation. That's whether it's at the state level, and I think Adrian Harris did a wonderful job and is doing a great job in New York. I'm from Wyoming, so of course I'm biased toward a lot of the good work that's being done in Wyoming. But there are states who are doing great work. But at the federal level, uh, I think it's really important when we have Controller Sue, who is working and doing a great job, and, and Secretary Yellen, it's really important that we all get on the same page, have stakeholder engagement, and get to a regulatory certainty that actually provides that access and that consumer protection. Consumer protection has to be at the core of this. Right. And so we have to make sure that that consumer protection doesn't block people out because the government knows better, but also gives them opportunity. And I think that's really like the crux of what we're thinking about right now. 
Well, Bakari and Kara, to both of your points, where is that line between government regulation and personal responsibility? Years ago, um, there were snake oil salesmen <clears throat> going around, and then we created the FDA that says something is safe and effective or if it's not. And if you decide to take something that's not safe and effective, according to the FDA at least, then you're taking some level of risk on your hands. Is there any room for that kind of a similar metric and when it comes to cryptocurrencies? Well, I mean, I think you start with um, access to resources and information. I mean, we don't even teach black kids financial literacy or science, technology, engineering, and math in schools, right? I mean, you, you, you don't have this concentrated program in our schools now, so how do you expect young people to be able to understand cryptocurrency? And so when you, when you, when you frame it out as such, you realize that if we're going to actually flip this on its head, then Coinbase, that put my good friend Kara on the spot, and many others have to do a better job of meeting individuals where they are. And so I think that's where the <coughs> private sector, uh, in the black church we call it standing in the gap, I think that's where the where uh, you know these private entities have to stand in the gap, and I think that's where you start because there is a certain level of individual responsibility that goes into um, being able to explore these markets, but that comes with a certain level of financial literacy. That financial literacy isn't gained by just going to school and learning on your own. That is actually gained because of individuals with some wealth of experience, and we have to be apostles, to use an, a better term, when we leave this room and go out and educate those young folk. It, yeah, I, would, I, I think that that's actually a great challenge to all of the crypto industry. It's one that Coinbase is taking to heart to learn and to understand how we can get into communities and how we can work with every, every type of community. And I think provide those services, provide that education. We provide uh, learn on our website and we try to educate through our website. But to your point, you've got to get into the communities to well, have the conversation. Have to, but you've got to have internet. To help to Absolutely. access a website. Absolutely. And yeah. so I think we, we would love to think through how there might be better opportunities to do some of those partnerships. Uh, I, I just think that there are so many opportunities to understand and to bring crypto to communities in a safe way, Correct. in an educated way. So, Kara, to that point, I, I was on your website just a short time ago. Um, and I didn't see this part, but if it's there, please correct me. Do, is there anywhere on your website where you explain just how high risk of an asset this is? We walk through, great question. We walk through a number of different ways to try to educate our users about what assets look like and, and what the risks are associated with those. We have an, a program called Learn, where if you learn and earn, if you go through and you watch the videos and you understand what the underlying asset is, what it does, does it sit on top of a blockchain, does it represent a blockchain, what is this asset? We, go, we walk through a lot of those on our website. I think we have a very transparent system, but that is at our core. Transparency is at the core of Coinbase. Mm. Not all of our, not all of our competitors do the same type of, of educating. And more importantly, I think we've got a lot of great exchanges here in the United States, but you have a lot of exchanges overseas who are under no obligation to U.S. citizens to provide education or to provide that disclosure. So you can go on our website and find a lot about our listing and our asset process. But you can't say the same for, for some of the foreign um, exchanges. So I would really encourage, understand who you're buying and selling, where you're doing that, how you're doing that, and, and look on their website for transparency, because that's really at the core. In plain English, that's the other part too. Oftentimes you get such complicated explanations and disclosures, and I think we've proven that, I don't know if anybody has bought a house lately, but the mortgage disclosures are insane, absolutely verifiably insane. And they don't work, right? I have no idea if I signed my life away when I bought a house a couple of years ago, no idea. And so these disclosures, we have to make sure that they're effective and that everyday Americans can read those. And if they can't, then what's the point? Well, I mean, Kara, great point. I actually just refinanced my house. And you're right. There's tons of paper. The person just puts tabs where I should put my initials or my <laughs> name. And I just generally just do it. Nobody really reads through all the paperwork. Um, but Bakari, over to you. And this is a point that John, again, was hitting on earlier. Do you believe that there's room for an FDIC for crypto, for the government to back some investment in cryptos? Or is that a slippery slope? That's a good question. That's a John O'Brien question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, I, I think that's a slippery slope. And, and you got to understand I'm decently conservative in, in terms of just my <laughs> just so you know where I come from. Like, y'all remember when uh, they used to mail your credit cards? You know, you used to just show up at the mailbox and you end up with a credit card you didn't even apply for. Y'all remember that or am I just talking French? OK, so my dad used to come home and my dad used to cut those credit cards up in front of us because he's of the belief that if you can't pay for it, you don't need it. So that's, that's kind of where I come from in terms of, so my, my, uh, I'm decently conservative when I look at ideals like this. 
Uh, I'm, I'm still the person that believes that you determine wealth by how many acres you own. So with that, that, with that understanding, I am someone who says that that is a, that is a decently slippery slope. I'd rather uh, figure out ways that we can come up with policy initiatives like the one that Kara just outlined in terms of ensuring that there's at least transparency with those players in the U.S. market, making sure we have financial literacy in places uh, that don't have access to that financial literacy. I think there are other things we need to do before we start getting out here and doing some um, abstract gambling uh, with, our eco with our economic ecosystem, which is already decently in shambles. Wow, interesting point. Um, Kara, over to you, and I want to talk to you about something I've actually worked on stories about. Um, some entrepreneurs in the black and brown community issuing their own coins to raise money to kind of circumvent the traditional financial system. Um, is that something that Coinbase would be more open to? Entrepreneurs, let's say I want to create, like Bakari mentioned, the Bakari coin because he wants to start up, you know, a farming business since he judges his wealth in acres. He wants to start up a farming business and buy 100 acres and he wants to put out 100 coins that, you know, can sponsor the purchase of these 100 acres. Would Coinbase be open to partnering with black and brown entrepreneurs for initiatives like this? I think we're, we're extremely excited to work with all different developers, black and brown included, and I think it depends on how the project is created. And it's really important right now, again, for Coinbase, we don't list what what we consider securities. And so if you want to get into banking law, we can bring back some of the regulators from the last <laughs> panel, but we don't list any securities. And so we have to, we really have to go through and assess what the coin does, what the asset does, what kind of promise it, it makes to people who may buy it. So we make those assessments. But I think what we're seeing to your point is this idea of there are so many new ideas. And so when we think about access and we think about how this is going to change our financial system, it's really about access to web three. One of the things that we just launched at Coinbase is it's called our DAP marketplace. And that is really how are you going to enter into the next evolution of using these tokens? So whether or not you're using it to raise money to build a farm or you're actually developing something that is an, a real estate coin, right? And you're actually buying a piece of that land, but it's, it, it's encapsulated in this coin, that's different. And so how do we think about um, creating these different types of coins and then launching into Web3? We have to ensure that black and brown communities and others understand how to access that because that's the next evolution of the financial system. Not just using Bitcoin to buy, sell, and hold, or using a stable coin to do a payment back and forth, but it's really about how do you launch into Web3 to access all of the other opportunities and use cases. One other thing I would just mention really quickly is remittances as a use case. I think that there are a lot of different communities who are leveraging remittances and the value of blockchain to send money all over the world to family, friends. We have a partnership in Mexico that allows families here in the United States, hundreds of thousands of them, to send money back to Mexico. And then anybody can walk into a Walmart or a convenience store and actually access that cash. It's really important innovations. But those that access is what's going to launch into the, the real Web3 and make it just change the world. I think to what John Hope Bryant was saying, that's kind of the his 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 like enthusiasm is infectious. I just wanted to get on here and like do jumping jacks or something because he was so excited. Uh, but I think that that's where we're headed. So Bukhari, back to you with really the same question. Isn't that the promise of cryptocurrency is decentralized finance that we can you know circumvent the traditional financial system that does have bias and already in it, both implicit and explicit? Would you be okay with the idea of other people being able to put out a coin to raise their own money? Or do you think there needs to be regulation to stop that? I don't, I don't like the question. Um, <laughs> it was a terrible, terribly premised question. No, I don't, I don't think there should be regulation to stop it, but I think there should be re regulation to ensure fairness. There should be regulation to ensure equity. I don't think you can have a free-for-all. And we talked about the promise. I mean, the promise of crypto is a lot like the promise of the United States. And I'm sorry to tell you, but like that promise ain't necessarily been reached yet. And so what we have to do is ensure that there are regulations in place to make sure we have access. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. we understand the flaws with, with crypto now. I, I don't want to keep people from creating their own coin, you know, calling it whatever, designing it whatever, to pay for whatever, backed by whatever, that's fine. However, it should not be in a marketplace if it does not reach certain standards. And I think that's where government comes and plays a role. So what standards are you looking for exactly? You seem to be hesitant about regulation. You say it's a slippery slope, but then what standards are you looking for? I, I think, I mean, I, I think we can, we can sit here all day and talk about policy standards, but one of the things that I, I let's look at broad parameters uh, to ensure fairness, to ensure equity, uh, to make sure that there's transparency. 
One of the things I don't want people doing is you have this bright new shiny coin and no one understands what it's backed by um, or no one understand who, where it originated from. Or, I mean, you, you want to be able to see and understand what you are putting in your wallet, for lack of a better term. I think transparency, fairness, equity are probably the three. If I was creating a law, I would bring in all of these private entities and I would or regulation mm -hmm. and say these are the three frameworks or goalposts that we're going to work from and be able to bring them in and deduce what a piece of legislation should look like. We've thought a lot about also how regulation, what that would look like, and it really takes a technical expertise as well, and it's something I think we need to have guiding principles, and it's ex I think we align exactly on those guiding principles, and then how, the devil is in the details. How do you actually, because this is a technology that disintermediates, and it's a technology, and I think, again, Controller Sue said this, um, I think on a podcast a while ago, that disintermediation, it changes what cons what the protections are for consumers, because it's, it's, it's immutable, it can't be changed. Changed, it's irreversible, so you may not have recourse. And so consumers need to understand when they do and when they don't have recourse. And so there are some there are some devil in the details when it comes to this disintermediating, disintermediating technology. And you need the you need that expertise inside the regulators. We've heard a lot about responsible innovation. It, it really takes responsible regulation as well to make sure that we unlock, to make it fair, make it equitable, make it safe, and all of those things have to come together with the, the, the government and the, the private industry. And frankly consumer groups, other uh, consumer advocates, whether it's, you know, whether it's the John, uh, John Hope Bryant Foundation, whether it's uh, other consumer advocates, we have to figure out a way to work together to make sure that all of these needs are met. We're almost out of time, but one thing I want to end on is uh, a lot of under, uh, not, I don't want to say underdeveloped, but uh, other countries outside of the United States, they're using crypto in a lot of different ways, using it as a currency, using different things. What do you think us here in the US, what can we learn from countries like El Salvador and other countries that have adopted crypto and maybe ways that we can democratize finance with some of the methods that they've used? I mean, I think you're going to start to see the United States deal with a 30 year problem in unique ways. I mean, inflation, my daddy called me the other day because the price of whiting at the Piggly Wiggly had gone up, right? <laughs> and I mean, he was livid about it. Um, I mean, that's a real concern. And so, you know, as you see inflation really hurting people's bottom line and people's pockets, I think you're going to start to see uh, us use unique forms of payment, currency, et cetera, uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever it may be, in different fashions. Um, I'm hard pressed to sit up here and say that uh, we should steal uh, El Salvador's, you know, economic system. Um, but what I will say is that as Bitcoin continues to, to grow and expand, as different countries utilize it as their currency, their go-to currency, you'll begin to see uh, this new uh, innovative form of payment and currency be utilized in extraordinary ways because we have some issues here that we have to attack or tackle in ways that are going to take some non-traditional ways of thought. And the, the global economy, there are countries all over the world who are trying to determine how to regulate this again, and, and they're grappling with the exact same questions we are. Right. And so whether it's the UK, the EU, India, Japan, they're all trying to, to tackle these hard questions of how do you make it safe? How do you make it secure? How do you make sure there are things you know, related to illicit finance? How do you make sure that you know when you're transacting with somebody that it's, it's a good guy, not a bad guy? So everybody is working on these same challenges and these same problems. And I think when we get to a really important part of the executive order, from President Biden was global cooperation and making sure that we create some standards and some and some general understanding between each other what we're what we're really fighting for. All right, we're almost out of town. I'm going to give you guys one last word. Um, a year from today, how will we see cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, when it comes to democratizing finance? Well, I mean, I hope it's better than it is today. <laughs> I mean, I think that's that's the hope that we have. Um, I hope that the many of the inequitable tenants that we see right now currently uh, will begin to deconstruct those and reimagine what they should look like. Um, I hope that the industry, particularly those who are the, the private form of the industry, become more um, diversified and look like this room. Um, and I hope that, that individuals have a fair, equitable, and transparent access to the product um, so that my little old church ladies aren't buying crypto that they don't understand and it's backed by you know, craziness. I want them to be able to um, you know, pay those graduation gifts in a cryptocurrency and they understand exactly what they're doing. And I think that's how you build wealth and sustain wealth. 
I would echo all those. The only thing I would add is, as the head of US policy, I feel obligated to say in a year, I hope we have a regulatory structure <laughs> that, that works at, at the federal level, that, that gives us certainty in the market, that gives those ladies the certainty that they need the, to understand fully what they're doing. And so it doesn't matter if you buy it in one state or another, or if you buy it and you're moving it back and forth between your children. At the end of the day, you know what you're getting and you feel, you feel excited about doing it. So we're really excited. Um, if, any, if anybody has any questions or in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out. Again, thank you so much for, for John Hope Bryant for inviting us and for the rest of the panelists. I'm extremely excited. This is a great day of, of speakers. And thank you, for, thank you for sitting next to me and for being such a gracious panelist with me. For sure. Thank you, guys.